Let's give a warm welcome as he comes to preach the word for the vow. Praise the Lord, everybody. That old song says, sometimes the clouds hang low. Every now and then darkness comes around us. I can't even see the road. And I ask this question, Lord, why so much pain? Oh, but he knows what's best for me. Even when I cannot, cannot see. God has been good to me. I won't complain. For God's been good to me he's been so good to me how many can testify and say more than this world could ever be <laughs> oh he's so good to me his spirit came to me and gave me victory God is so good to me I won't complain let's love him today hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah. Come on, let's praise Him all over the building. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Darkness has tried to come, but darkness is going to leave before this conference is over. The sun is going to shine bright. You're going to have clarity and direction, victory and power, fervor and strength. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, victory's coming to you in this meeting tonight. Somebody shout glory. glory. For victory is mine. Victory is mine. Oh, victory today is mine. For I told Satan to give.
children. Sister, Sister Dylan, many years ago, you, you walked up to me and two of my buddies at a youth convention. We just loved you. And, and Bishop Dylan, he'd come to West Virginia and preach. He would stand on top. You remember that West Virginia camp platform is the highest in UPC history. It's way up here. He would climb up on the top of that and preach to all of us young people. He preached about the power of the blood. You talk about killing the weeds and the cracks of the sidewalk. I'm just a teenager. We love your preaching. I'm just going to tell you right now where I go. You're my type of preacher. I'm just going. And Sister Dylan. But she said to me, she said, you boys need to start praying for your wives right now. God, to keep them and protect them. Well, I took you serious. And next year I'll be married 20 years. Amen. We got four children. I have a daughter that graduated. She, but when she was about two and a half, she was, she was born with a little fire in her. Her name's Lakin. Somebody take her toy, she'll pour her own hair out. I thought she needs a Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? I mean, parents know what I'm talking about. And I'll never forget. One day I heard her scream from the bedroom, Sister Dylan. And it just happened to be that day that I heard about some kid that got eaten by a dog and had 50 stitches. And we were watching my sister-in-law's dogs that day. And I thought, oh my goodness, the dog has attacked my kid. You know what I was thinking? Doggone. I ran into that room. And when I got into that room, surprising to me is that the dog had a hold of the head of her baby doll and she had a hold of the feet. And they were playing tug of war. And she started saying, no, Chloe, that's mine. No, Chloe, that's mine. Finally, she won. Jerked that baby dog all two and a half years old of her. Screaming all the way a little girl can. She jerked it out of that dog's mouth. But she didn't just get back what the dog was trying to take. And she chased that dog through the house. When the dog got in the corner, she hit that dog right in the head. You know what she was saying? I'm not just going to get back what you try to take from me. I'm going to make you wish you'd ever mess with me. Now it's the first night of Apostolic Conference. We are Holy Ghost filled, water baptized, washing of blood. We're not going to lose. We are the victorious people. We are the people of the name. We are the people that have God's hand upon them. We are going to win. I wish everybody for just a few moments would get out and shout a victory. It doesn't matter how you feel. God's going to make a way. Come on, make a joyful noise. Come on, everybody in the building, shout for a minute. There's victory. There's victory. There's victory. Blood couldn't drown it. It's been through the fire, but the fire couldn't burn it. I'm talking about the church, the book of Revelation. It's built on a rock. It's a firm foundation. It's been through the flood. It's been through the fire, but one of these days, it's going up. Somebody shout, it's going up higher. Oh, clap your hands and praise him. Yeah. Ezra chapter 4 Ezra chapter 4 
I feel better. So much better. Tell me about this. Come on, since I laid my burdens down. You're about to lay some sickness down. You're about to lay some fear down. You're about to lay some inside. You're not going to leave this building the same way you came tonight. Something's going to happen in this building. Look at your neighbor and say, I feel victory. Every hand lifted. I open one hand lifted. I open to the Lord. I want you to tell the Lord, I'm sorry for being negative. You know I'm telling you the truth. I'm sorry for believing Facebook. Oh my. I don't mean for y'all to say it, amen. I just, I'm just saying what you, what you needed to say, amen. I'm sorry for believing mainstream media. I, 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 there's one we got to repent of right now. I'm sorry for believing the report of the devil. Whose report? Man, I know I'm in the South. Somebody shout, I will believe the report of the Lord. Well, that's what I'm going to preach tonight. Clap your hands and praise Him as we get into the Word. Ezra chapter 4, verse 23. I give honor to Bishop Dillon, his family. Pastor Dillon, thank you for preaching. I love this message. You know, when I committed my life at age 16, dedicated and sold out, I just didn't want to go to hell. But I never dreamt it'd be this good. It's the best life. Amen. To all of our elders, I honor you here today, our missionaries, our global missionaries, our North American missionaries. You are my hero. My dad and mom have given their life to church planting since 1990. They're planting their fourth work right now. My dad is 66, and my mom's none of your business. I love you. There's nothing like the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. To my friend Evangelist Shane Burns, so glad you're here tonight. Thanks for being here with me. Ezra 4, 23. Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem and to the Jews very happily went to the Jews and made them cease by force and power to stop building the church, the temple of God. Stop! It's mandated by the government. No more church building. That's what it was. Then cease the work. Then ceased the work of the house of God which is at Jerusalem so it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius king of Persia now you have to know that it's listing a time of the second year of the king of the reign of Darius for a reason it's, it's time sensitive and I'd like to preach to you for just a moment is just a letter from the enemy Everybody say a letter from the, from the enemy. How many of you here have a letter from the enemy with you? Would you, would you hold it up right here? Yeah, yeah. We're going to tear that up before this is over. I'm just going to tell you. We're going to shred this piece of paper. Everybody say a letter from the enemy. You may be seated. A letter from the enemy. I think to understand the narrative here tonight is why did the work of God cease? I, uh, at the beginning of the year, I toward a sort of toward the end of last year, I took took a journey through the scripture 
uh, studying prophets. Brother Shatwell had talked to me about reading some of the book of the prophets, and I so I dove in it, and I'm, I'm a slow reader. And so I dragged my feet through the Scripture. Amazing what happens is when you walk through, slow through Scripture. I mean, sometimes we check off the box, and we really don't know what we read. Even so much, sometimes we go back the next night and read, and it takes about six or seven verses till we realize we already read that the night before. And there's a witness of the Spirit. Amen. And I, I just read slowly through Jeremiah, and I read chronologically through the book of Jeremiah, and then Ezekiel and Daniel. And I jumped from Daniel, and I went to Ezra, and Ezra and in Nehemiah, even into Esther. And in the book of Ezra, I stopped and went to the book of Haggai and Zechariah, chronologically in time of trying to learn what was going on. And Jeremiah prophesied, he said, better submit to Nebuchadnezzar and, and go on to Babylon and just need, you're going to go there. If you don't, he's going to come and get you and take you there. Destroy your houses, everything's going to be ruined. They didn't listen to him. What happened is three invasions later, you'll find that the children of Israel have been taken by captivity into Babylon or also what was known as Persia. Uh, Esther records that there was 127 provinces, really nations. Those provinces had kings and Artaxerxes or Cyrus or one of them, whoever at the time would have been the king of kings of that entire landmass of what was mostly of the known world. Why were they scattered? Why did God send a prophet to say, you're getting out of Jerusalem, the city where I put my name? I'm going to tell you why. Because the city of Jerusalem was no longer a place where the name of God was reverenced. It had become a melting pot of world religion. When you look in Kings, and you'll find that, that Solomon had built really probably one of the wonders of the world. He, and... Queen of Sheba drove a thousand miles with a plane, train, or automobile to get there. And she said, the half was not yet told me. And it was beautiful. But before it was over with, he, he, he fell in love with outlandish women. And, and they say he was wise. The Bible says he's wise. But he had 700 wives. <laughs> and 300 concubines. And you, you, wonder, you want to say, what are you thinking? But... The reality is, is he's, he's joining legions with other nations by marrying their, their, their princesses and nations are gathering. And instead of keeping it pure and true and what God wanted, he started compromising his truth to be accepted. It was, it was, now, it was now a place where... You can look over here and there's a, there's a temple to Escalon and to Baal and world places. And now there's not just the name of one God being worshipped. It's a melting pot of all the idols of the world that are now represented there. It's a melting pot of world religion. And it made God sick for he said, I am a jealous God. Somehow his favor went to his head. And he started trying to please the people instead of keep true with God. And in my prayer today, I just feel just a moment at the beginning of this message to tell you that you have to be very careful how you label success. I'm so glad that I'm in a building that's this nice and I, I give honor to the leadership here. I rejoice with you, but if you missionaries aren't careful, you will look at this building and look at your storefront and feel like... If we're not careful that we will judge our success by how many people are in attendance. And when our brother or somebody asks us, we haven't seen since two years because of COVID, and we walk up and they say, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. How many of you are running now? Don't ask a missionary that. They're going to give you their Easter attendance. As every other pastor that has pastored for decades. Let's just be real here for a minute. And we start comparing ourselves among ourselves on what is success. And if we are not careful, we will see people that have connections in their com communities. They're serving on all these boards. They're accepted by the community. I'm not against that, but that's not what God has called us to do. 
We're not here to build buildings. We're here to see conversions. You can have a crowd with no converts. I'm just going to hit it and I'm going to get on. But we cannot become people that just honor ourselves and how many people are in the... I realize 120 on the day of Pentecost. I realize 3,000 were added to the church. I realize there's a book of numbers. But you got to stop judging yourself according to what everybody else is doing. God's called us to preach the gospel. And it's the gospel that makes converts. We cannot change the message to keep up with somebody. We we cannot change who we are. Just have some financial status of somebody else. I come to preach you. You hold on to the gospel. You hold on to the apostolic message. Somebody shout amen. amen. Buy the truth. And sell it not. Can I just stop here and say that the gospel still works. The power is in the seed. If you will preach it with love, you will see repentance. Hold on a minute. I believe in people getting baptized and people getting the Holy Ghost. But when's the last time you celebrated somebody repenting? I rarely ever see a a tweet or whatever, about we had five to repent tonight. But when you would always talk to my dad, he would tell how many repented, how many got baptized, and how many got the Holy Ghost. Cause the Acts 238 message is repent and be baptized, every one of you. Can I say here tonight, repentance still matters. Repentance is what brings conversion. We've got to have We've got to have repentance. Bishop Wright, I'll never forget the message he preached on the gift of repentance. Impacted my life and changed my life forever. My dad's preaching for me tonight in Zanesville. I tuned in before church here tonight and he was preaching on stopping by the church on your way to hell. That's Frank Bounds for you right there. That place was roaring in there. Repentance matters. And if we're not careful, we'll become like Solomon. That we attain to a place of favor. And then we lose what God has started. And God said, I can't stand it anymore. And he hit them with Nebuchadnezzar a heathen. And it scattered them all over Persia. Jeremiah told it would happen. Ezekiel was the prophet during it. You see, Daniel talks about at the end of it and how we're going to get back to where it began. I feel my witness here tonight. Ezra is the scribe, the man of God that the Lord called to lead the people back on the first, uh, the first uh, going back to Jerusalem. Everybody say, get back to Jerusalem. Ezra brings them back and we find the book of Ezra that talks about going back to do what? To build the house of God. Why? Because Solomon's was destroyed. And if there is going to be a gathering back to Jerusalem, it only sounds wise that the first thing that we do is build the house of God. Somebody shout, build the house. And they do, they do, and they have a carpenter. He is a governor as well. His name is Zerubbabel, and he is building the house of God. Chapter 3 tells us that when they built the foundation of the house of God, that you couldn't discern the noise between the elders crying and the youth praising and shouting, the young men shouting. There was a noise that went out when they celebrated. Just the foundation was built. The walls weren't up. There is no rooms that's built. It's just a foundation. And somebody say they shouted. When they shouted, the noise spread. Something's going on in Jerusalem. It sounds like a revival. When revival begin to be allowed in the city, guess what happens? The enemy shows up. 
the enemy shows up and says, we would like to come and help you build the house of God. But Zerubbabel discerned that they weren't there to help. They were only there to distract. Not everybody that comes to your church is going to be a help. Listen to me. Not everybody that comes or has a little money in their pocket, has a little influence in the community, is coming to help you build that work. They might be coming there to stop you from doing what God has called you to do. We just can't be numbers people, and I'm not against numbers, but we've got to get back to a place of discernment and realize, is this of God or is this not of God? I've had people to say they wanted to come and help me and they didn't do anything but drain me. And when Paul went to Macedonia because he had a vision from a man that said, come and help us. And he gets there and he has a prayer meeting and Lydia is converted. Guess who shows up? A woman of divination. And she says, these are the men of God which bring us the truth. She spoke with flattery, but she had a bad spirit. I want you to lift your hands in this room, and I want you to ask God to give you discretion. Everybody, I want you to lift your hands and say, God, I'm asking you to give me discretion. Help me discern those that have come to help me from those that have come to hurt me. Somebody say amen. amen. Now my voice is very weak tonight for some reason. I don't want to be misinterpreted. I'm not against cele celebrating people receiving the Holy Ghost. But we've got to hold on to our apostolic truths and realize that if God called me to that city, there is going to be a breakthrough. And I don't have to compromise one thing to see it happen. Not one thing. Come on, you keep praying, you keep fasting, you keep preaching, and you keep reaching, and God's going to give you the breakthrough. Some of you are going to have some things that happen this week. It's going to happen back home while you're here because the prophetic spirit's going to come over you, and you're going to speak life for there's been death. I'm telling you, it's going to happen tonight. The foundation is built. Everybody shout, it started. And the foundation is laid. He discerns that they're not of God, that they're there to do nothing but distract. When they do, when he rejects them, they write a letter in Ezra 4 and 11. It's right here. I want you to get your letter out tonight if you have it. I rolled it up so it looked like a scroll. Are you with me? And this is the letter. Thy servants, the men on this side of the river, and at such a time, this is a letter to Artaxerxes, be it known to the king that the Jews which came up from thee to us are coming to Jerusalem. Everybody shout, they're here. Building the rebellious and the bad city and have set up the walls thereof and joined the foundations. Be it known now unto the king that if this city be builded and the walls set up again, then will they not pay toll, tribute, and custom, and so thou shalt in damage the revenue of the kings. Let me just word it this way. If you let them build the church, it's gonna harm what's been going on. Almost sounds true. Because something does happen when you build the church. He said, now because we have maintenance from the king's palace and it was not meet for us to see the king's dishonor, therefore have we sent and certified the king 
That search may be made in the book of the records of thy father, so shalt thou find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city and hurtful unto the kings and provinces and that they have moved sedition within the same of old time. For which cause was this city destroyed? We certify the king that if this city be built again and the walls thereof set up, by this means thou shalt have no portion on this side of the river. Signed, the enemy. If you let it continue, it's not going to be what you want. Search the record. And you know what happens? Artaxerxes searched the records. And in the records, what he finds is what they said is almost an element of truth. Because they did rule the land when they were right with God. They did have dominion and every city wanted to come and be like them. It was, a, it was the kingdom of God upon the earth. And Artaxerxes searched the records and it seemed to be similar to what they were saying. And he sent word back to them and he said, tell them to stop building the house of God. And they ran with haste to say to them, stop. Stop what you're doing. You can't have church. You don't build this. You got to stop what you're doing. This is not going to go forward. It's done. Has it been easy? Now, I'm not comparing governments here, but has it been easy to plant a church during COVID? Somebody told me Corona meant king. I think Corona means inconvenient. (laughs) Uncertain. Are y'all with me? But it seems like for a minute that church growth has stopped. Church services have stopped. And the Bible says, and the work of God ceased. That's how chapter 4 ends. But it's not over. Because chapter 5 verse 1 says, Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Ido prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel even unto them when the letter was written the lie from hell and the work of God ceased it did something to the prophets the prophets came alive and the prophets started prophesying it's not over get up and go build that church Get up and build that church. It is going to be finished. Don't you stop working. Don't you stop praying. Don't you stop. It is. Somebody shout. They started prophesying. And you know what they prophesied? And I feel like tonight that there's going to be some prophecy going on in this room because some of you feel like it was over. I just come to tell you it was just a delay. It's not over. It was just delayed. And it's only going to be delayed. I want everybody to jump up on your feet and shout, it's not over, it's just delayed. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not over. It's just delayed. The vision will be filled. The church will be finished. The work of God will be established. God's name will be in that city he called you. The devil's doing everything he can to stop a bit. He can't stop the church. Somebody shout, it's not over. It's just delayed. Clap your hands and praise him for a few seconds. How many want to hear what the prophets prophesied? How many want to hear it? When was it ceased? In the second year of Darius. So Haggai chapter 1 starts in the second year of Darius. The book of Haggai and the book of, book of Zechariah were written when the letter was believed. When the letter had an effect. There's some lies going around. But you got to make up in your mind. You're not going to believe the report of the enemy. 
There's people in your churches that have said things on Facebook about your church and you sat back and you started believing it. There's some things that were said on social media. There's some things that were said in your community. But you can't believe what the enemy is trying to get you to believe. You're going to finish it. It will come to pass. God's going to do what he said he's going to do. And he's going to finish the work that he began. If you believe it, I want you to shout hallelujah. Come on, everybody, jump to your feet and take a minute and shout to the Lord in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Wednesdays might have been a little slow, but God's going to bring miracles on your midweek Bible studies. I was teaching the other night and randomly started talking about miracles I'd seen. Withered hands healed. A leg grow. Things that I would dream of seeing as a kid when missionaries were talking about. Blinded eye. I was in the middle of a Bible study and just started talking about miracles. All of a sudden on the front row, this lady started moving. A commotion. They got excited. Started crying. A first time guest. After church, her sister came to me and said, I have to tell you what happened when you were preaching. I said, what happened? She said, you know the lady that jumped off the bridge there and had tried to take her life in town? I said, yes, I heard about that. And she said, well, that's my sister. She's here tonight. She has one leg shorter than the other because of the cripple that that caused by that accident. She said, but when you said the name of Jesus and started talking about the miracles that God was doing, she said instantly her leg straightened out as the other because there's still power in the name of Jesus. I, just like you, can't wait on everybody that's staying home to get back to church to have a good sermon and to have a good service. There's people coming that are hungry that want what you have. Brother Huntley taught us, he said, if you wait to preach your greatest message on your biggest, to your biggest crowd, you'll never preach it. It doesn't matter if there's two or three. Preach it, believe it, and you'll see it. Clap your hands and shout here today. Haggai says something like this. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? He said, the time has not come. The time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Why are you saying those things? So in chapter 2, he says something like this. Yet now be strong. Look at your neighbor and say, be strong. Oh, Zerubbabel. Be strong. Two years ago, Bishop, I stood right here and preached the same service. And I preached on despise not small beginnings. And I talked about Home missions. Yes, sir. Growing up in home missions church. I talked about Zerubbabel with the plumb line in his hand. And all he's got is the foundation and he's discouraged. And he's trying to figure out what his next move is. Anybody ever been there? Come on, one, two. Can I get real? Come on, I've seasoned. Churches that are seasoned. I'm in a church next year will be 80 years. I'm the third pastor in 80 years. And there's some Sundays. What's my next move? Discouraged church builder. And he's holding a plumb line in his hand. A plummet, scripture says. Zechariah 4. What am I going to do? I can't build. I I didn't understand then what I have received now. I've known what I'm going to preach in this service since January. Sister Dillon, since January I knew what I would preach tonight. And I found out why he was discouraged. Because he's trying to build a church. When the letter he received said he had to stop. And he's wanting to build. And he can't. His hands are tied. He's been told no. It's not there. You can't do it. But when he was told no. And he's discouraged. Somebody to the kingdom that can hear from God showed up. Come here, Brother Watts. He showed up. And he looks at him. And he tells him. He said, oh, be strong, old Zerubbabel. 
Somebody shout, be strong. be strong. He said, he said, for I am with you, saith the Lord. Two months of no church, but I'm with you and it's not over. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on, COVID is not gonna hurt you. There's gonna be a propelling out of this meeting tonight. It will happen. He said, be strong. He goes on, he said, I'm gonna shake the nations and the desire of all nations shall come. I will fill this house with glory. Saith the Lord of hosts, the silver is mine and the gold, I wish somebody would prophesy that right, the silver is mine. Come on, I wish somebody could believe it, jump up and say the finances are on the way. God's gonna make a way. Come on, I said God's gonna make a way. Somebody shout, the silver belongs to God, the gold belongs to God. He said it's gonna be yours if you'll believe it. It's not gonna be the way it used to be. It's just the end time church ain't gonna be like it used to be. That's not what the Lord said. He said the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former saith the Lord of hosts and in this place will I get peace saith the Lord of hosts I've come to preach to you tonight it's going to be greater than even you could have imagined but you can't stop you got to keep working you got to keep building you've got to keep reaching come on clap your hands and shout amen I'm gonna put it in short version. He said, and I'm gonna run every heathen away from you. Everything that's been attacking you, I'm gonna run it away from you. You will finish it. You're gonna finish the work. If you believe it, shout amen. amen. So when Zechariah starts prophesying, in the second year of Darius, he starts prophesying. And Zechariah, when they stop the work of God, Zechariah starts seeing stuff. And the thing that he saw for Zerubbabel was he saw the seven-tiered golden candlesticks. In the New Testament of Revelation, that's the churches of God. And Zechariah sees the church. And he sees olive trees on each side of it. Golden pipes with oil flowing to it. And he asked the prophet, what do you see? He said, I don't understand. And he just sort of words it this way. Knowest thou not what these be? I said, no, my Lord. Then he answered. Are y'all ready? Then he answered and spake unto me saying, this is the word of the Lord, unzerubable saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. <laughs> Who art thou, O great mountain? That thing that's standing between you and a breakthrough, who do you think you are? You're going to be made a plain before this meeting is over. It will. Somebody shout grace. grace. Then the hands of Zerubbabel have laid this foundation of this house. Listen to me, Zerubbabel, as the prophet prophesied. Zechariah, he said, his hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? All I've got's a storefront. All I've got's a Bible study. All I've got's an application filled out. All I've got is a, is a Christmas for Christ grant. All I've got, can I tell you what God put in your spirit? He's going to fulfill. It is going to happen. I've come to tell you it's not stopped. It's just delayed. It's not stopped. And if you will receive it tonight, you're going to feel a spirit of impartation come over your spirit. God's going to put some fire I want you to lift your hands and say, let me feel. Let me feel the prophecy of your scripture.
I'm not denying that you're not having tough times. But in the midst of this, three Hebrew children that would not bow were thrown in a fiery furnace. But under pressure, they did not compromise. They stood. And God showed up. And a decree was made by the king. The God of the Hebrew children is going to be the God of this nation. Come on, Daniel was put in a lion's den. But the lions couldn't eat him. Come on, is there anybody here that's had some struggles before you got to this meeting? I come to tell you, you are not going under. You're about to resurrect in apostolic power. Take your hand like this. It says, getting ready to turn around. See what they did? They started believing the prophecies. They got up and started working as if there was no decree. They just went back and the elder of Israel started building, started having church, started doing what they're supposed to do. They did. They started teaching Bible studies. Thank you for teaching Bible studies. I teach a Bible study to a family every Wednesday night at 6 o'clock before church. I'll teach a Bible study as long as I'm alive. Keep teaching Bible studies. You got to keep building. You got to keep working. Just don't set back. And when they believe the prophecy and started working, they get another letter. A letter comes in the mail that opposes that one. And said, we went back and have checked the records. And Cyrus already made a law. Cyrus wasn't just a king. He's the king of kings. And he said this. You leave those Jewish people alone. You let them have access. Here it is. To all of the gold. And all of the silver of the land. That's what he said. All the gold. And all the silver of the land. Is going to belong to them. He said I want you to help them. Don't you oppose them. And if you oppose them. We're going to take wood from your own house. And we're going to hang you on it. I come to preach to you. If you will just go in forward motion, there is going to come the blessing of the prophecies. I just want to know, has anybody in this room received a word from the Lord over the work that you're doing? Raise your hand. Run up here. If you've got a prophecy, you've got a word over the work, run up here. You went because you had a word. Hasn't happened yet, but there's a prophecy over you. Some of you that haven't got a word are getting ready to get the word in the next 10 minutes. I come to tell you what the Holy Ghost has told me. When they believed the prophecy. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you're not going, to, you're not going to under this. is going to be your best year yet. I wish somebody turn around and speak it. The devil's saying one thing. It's going to be your best year. Come on, I want you to turn around and prophesy to somebody. It's going to be your best year. Come on, press closer. I want you to get closer. Come on, all you missionaries, run up here. Missionaries, kids, I've been praying for you today. You believe the hand of God is on, is on your life? Do you believe it? Lift your hands. You believe the hand of God is on your life? Lift your hands and receive of the Lord. Every family, go ahead and lift your hands and receive of the Lord.
I want everybody in the room. Lift your hands to the Lord and receive of His Spirit right now. I want everybody to stop praying. I want you to listen. There's a few things in this room. One of the things that we're dealing with right now, one of the things, is there's a spirit of infirmity. You dealt with sickness. It got, got your attention so much that it, it brought a spirit of infirmity into your life. Listen. Listen. I walked up to a young preacher. Please hear me. Walked up to a preacher in our church. Sick over and over and over again. Pray for him. Call him. Not at church. Powerful young man. Father the Holy Ghost spoke to me. I walked up to him. I said, you have a spirit of infirmity. You are not sick at all. They will never diagnose you. I said, you have a, you're dealing with the Spirit. I said, but God's going to deliver if you believe what I'm telling you is true. He was instantly delivered. He thought he was going to die. Some of you are dealing with a spirit of fear. Somebody, somewhere said something and you believed it. And you have forgotten about the prophecies that brought you to where you are. <laughs> I want Brother Morgan to come. I want him to tell you what is in his spirit. But there is, listen, tonight's going to be the start of it. But there's going to be a reminding of prophecies. There's going to be a stirring of prophecies. And faith is going to hit this building like it's never happened before. Come here, Bishop. Paul writes his first letter to Timothy, putting the house of the Lord in order. Second letter he writes, it's very apparent that Timothy has given himself over to a spirit of fear. Ephesus, everything that had gone on there, he was intimidated by it. And so this is finally what the Apostle Paul told him. He said, now concerning the prophecies that went before on thee, I want you to remember them, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. The enemy's trying to strike fear in our hearts, but we need to go to war for our prophecies. You need to fight for your prophecy tonight. You need to open your mouth right now and go to war against every spirit of fear, affliction, intimidation every go to war go to war for it you're not taking my prophecy you're not taking my word I go to war right now in the spirit God's not a man that he should lie that's it go to war for it 
Get bold about it tonight. Go after it in the Holy Ghost right now. That's it in the name of Jesus. Start remembering the prophecies. Stir up the gift that's within you. Stir it up. Stir it up. You stir it up. Stir up the gift. Mukisha makata yalalabaha. Shodora mahaka. Oh, don't stop. War for it. War for it. Go to war for it. I remember what God said. I remember the tongues of interpretation. I remember the word I got in prayer. I remember the prophecies that came. You're not going to take them from me. I don't care what kind of letter you write. I don't care what you say. My God reigns here tonight. The king that spoke it did not lie. It's a royal decree. Jesus' name. I challenge you to join with as many as you can right now and pray in the Holy Ghost. We're going to war for the word of the Lord. We're going to war for the prophecy. That's it. Stir, help them stir it up. Let that old prophecy that's almost become dormant, let it be stirred up tonight. That's it. Let it be stirred. Get it back in your spirit. Get it back in your heart. I'm not going to give up this prophecy.